Uh, first, I want to give uh, my uh, little talk uh, without slides, then Andra will give a presentation and share some data, and then we'll take questions. We very much welcome questions or remarks from the audience. Please use the QA button to submit your questions or remarks. Uh, use the chat button only if you want to warn me of uh, problems with the video, audio, and so on, and I should keep an eye on it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, tonight's talk about robots and pandemics happens um, while more and more regions of the world are reopening to business after lengthy lockdowns. Uh, the lockdown was the low-tech solution to dealing with a pandemic. Uh, hopefully, we are now better equipped to come up with some high-tech solutions. Uh, this pandemic has been a reality check of sort for the high-tech world. Um, uh, if there is one thing we learn from this pandemic is, uh, let me use a strong language, how pathetic our world-famous high-tech world is. Uh, the great Silicon Valley that has so many meetup groups discussing the coming of the singularity or the super intelligence, uh, the great Silicon Valley quickly ran out of toilet paper toilet paper, let alone face mask. And for months, our healthcare workers, uh, to which we are all uh, grateful for their work, uh, were experiencing shortages of the critical equipment needed to protect them. So, so far, with the exception of biotech, of course, the high-tech world has not contributed much to the fight against the virus. <clears throat> and the AI in particular has shown how useless it can be in real life. Uh, very good at learning how to play video games, uh, but mostly uh, helpless at uh, helping us find a treatment um, or develop a vaccine. <clears throat> I can only name one contribution of AI to the science of COVID-19, uh, the discovery of COVID-19 antibodies at academic, uh, Academia Sinica in, uh, in uh, Taiwan. So, uh, the, the disappointment role played by technology outside of biotech in dealing with this pandemic makes it urgent, in my opinion, to think about what can technology do to help prevent the next pandemic. Now, <clears throat> nonetheless, we have witnessed, we have seen a modest acceleration in the use of robots uh, for tasks that humans uh, cannot do. Uh, either because they're dangerous task or because um, the people who should uh, who would normally do them <clears throat> uh, were ordered to stay home. Uh, the concern, of course, is that robots will keep those jobs even after the pandemic is over. Uh, companies that adopt uh, robots during the pandemic may decide that they don't need their human employees anymore. Um, I personally haven't seen the evidence of a widespread replacement of humans with robots, but I understand the concern when unemployment is so high. I think much of the fear is based on the belief that machines can indeed perform any job that humans perform. Uh, that's why, first of all, I don't know if Andre agrees, but I would really like to decouple AI and robotics. <clears throat> uh, most of today's robots uh, that are really used in the real world uh, are more closely related to, to the construction excavator, maybe to the washing machine, than to the robots that you see in Hollywood movies. Uh, grasping and moving are still difficult tasks for robots. And their intelligence in making decisions is very limited, very limited, sometimes non-existent. So there has been progress in AI, but I have seen a little of it in the real world robots, especially in affordable robots that can be mass produced. So before we start thinking of robots replacing humans in every possible field, um, I think we need a, real, a reality check of what they uh, can do. Uh, now, <clears throat> one important point in my opinion is that this pandemic could be an opportunity to increase the development of medical robot technologies. Uh, in fact, um, those, in my opinion, are among the most important uh, robots we can, we can have. 
in fact, I am surprised that no government is making that a strategic goal. I don't know if I'm wrong, Andra, uh, correct me, but uh, remember the DARPA grant, chal grant challenge uh, that had a reward for the best self-driving vehicle. Uh, we've even, we have even had grand challenges for robots that play soccer. Uh, why can't we have a medical robotics challenge? Uh, maybe, maybe stage in a real hospital. So I am aware of small initiatives in, in this field, like um, uh, Ayanna Howard uh, launched a small program on healthcare robotics at uh, Georgia Tech, uh, but not of any major uh, program of this kind. Um, <clears throat> so for this purpose, I also ask Andra to speak a little bit about the trends in robotics, not only what robots are able to do today to help uh, with the pandemic, but to give us an idea what they could be able to do in the future. So we can imagine uh, how the next generation of robots can help deal uh, and even prevent uh, pandemics. So this concludes my introductory rant. <clears throat> uh, and now I will let Andra talk and she'll also introduce Silicon Valley Robotics and then we'll have questions and uh, more discussion. All yours. Thank you so much, Piero. I'm going to answer at least one of your questions on Thursday in our next talk. I think we'll be unveiling an international COVID robotics challenge. And I'm looking forward for more information from Dr. Zhang about the um, initiative that IARA is putting together. And this is where uh, IARA being the international Alliance of Robotics Associations, of which Silicon Valley Robotics is a member. And this is exactly one of the first things that we thought about this year as what is the most useful thing that a more or less meta organization of robotics organizations can do. And it's to speed up the development of useful robotics. And of course, we saw the DARPA Robotics Challenge that was responding to the Fukushima uh, nuclear meltdown and the you know corresponding disaster scenarios in Japan and it's certainly not the only time that we've looked towards robots in a disaster scenario. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that so what I'm going to do now is share my screen see if I can master the tech here and carry on with the presentation and please uh, do send me your questions in the Q&A and we have plenty of time for, for me to really answer your questions. So I want to talk about COVID-19 robots and us and the trends. And one of the interesting things is how much the trends as a result of the pandemic actually reflect the trends that were behind this as well. Um, I have to find out now exactly what control is going to advance my slides. Excellent. So Silicon Valley Robotics as an association, we are a non-profit association formed by robotics companies in the Bay Area who came together in 2010 to say, we see a new wave of robotics coming and we don't see much interest in investing in robotics and we need to somehow come together in a way to support that. And our mission is literally to support innovation and commercialization of robotics technologies. And we do a lot of work with startups at very, very early stages. And we've done a lot to introduce investors to the world of robotics. And I'm going to refer to a report that's just come out from Silicon Valley Bank, which echoes a lot of the findings that we have seen in the last over the course of this decade. We're only 10 years old as an organization, but this last decade is really the emergence of what I often call robotics 2.0. We've had 50 years of industrial robotic automation, but robotics 2.0 is robots leaving the factory and moving out into many, many other jobs in the real world. And many of those robots look very different to the robots that we've um, previously seen. And a good example actually is just this little um, picture here, which I think is a robotics startup 
from UC Berkeley, Covariant AI, and they're able to use artificial intelligence, machine learning to develop robots that are safe in operation while people are around them. And this is called collaborative robotics or cobots. And the fact that we are talking about having robots that don't require safety fencing around them is one of the really significant differences in Robotics 2.0. But also the fact that Silicon Valley is leading the world in much of the development of robotics. And where we've been home to so much other tech that people don't realize just how strong the Silicon Valley area is in the development of robotics. But clearly with Stanford, with the universities of California, and with the national labs that are in this area, we do on my last count, and we have a map on our website pointing to these, have more than 50 robotics research institutions in the Bay Area. And so what I'm going to talk about today is bringing together often what people know Silicon Valley Robotics for is for the events that we put on. And the events are what I call a tactic rather than a strategy. We don't exist to put on events. We exist to support innovation and commercialization of robotics technologies. And often we can do that very successfully through putting on events. And when, the, when we could see the pandemic unfolding in January, early February, it became clear that this was a global issue to which we needed to ask the question, how can robotics help? What is robotics going to do to respond to this? And so as an association, we started a weekly series to talk about this with roboticists, with people that were involved in the fight against COVID, and just to explore the angles of um, what is happening with robots and COVID-19. So we started a weekly evening discussion series in March, and it, it generated a lot of fascinating insights for me, and hopefully for everybody who participated. I'm going to refer a lot to some of the things that I learned in the process of doing this weekly series with some of our guests. For example, Dr. Robin Murphy came on our webinar several times, and she is the world's leading expert in disaster robotics. She works out of, she's the Raytheon esteemed professor in computer science and engineering at Texas A&M. She's also the person who took robots to 911, pretty much the day of the, um, the, the, the very first day. And she has managed a lot of the United States disaster response since then. And she's expanded on that to disaster sites around the world. She really is the world's leading expert on disaster robotics. And as part of this, in 2014, uh, she chairs another association. So she chairs an association for search and rescue robotics. She also chairs Robotics for Infectious Diseases, which was formed post-2014, 2015, um, during the Ebola outbreak. And this was in partnership with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy with multiple universities and agencies, as it says here. And I think this is one of the, um, one of the sad uh, things in the recent terms is that much of this work was disbanded or sidelined in the recent administration. But the, uh, a lot of the material and the, the um, people behind these networks and initiatives continued to work on robotics for um, an understanding what can robotics do during the pandemic based on the understanding of what can robotics do during the Ebola outbreaks. And in, this is a, um, a slide that Robin shared with us in March and April, and I think it was um, the date of this one. I just have to double check whether I'm sharing. Okay, I'm sharing the April one. It was updated 
uh, on a regular basis and I'm about to show you the one a month later. But this gives you some ideas of how sophisticated the understanding of what role robots can play in the pandemic was for someone like Robin who's an expert in this. And through tracking um, various articles, um, media discussions and contacts, she was collecting data on 16 different countries that were using robots for public safety, public works and non-clinical public health. And examples of that, as you can see, quarantine enforcement, disinfecting of public spaces, identification of infected people, public service announcements. For example, I believe there was a robot in Times Square giving public service announcements and monitoring traffic flows. There were seven countries deploying robots in clinical care in a range of um, actions from disinfecting point of care to healthcare worker telepresence to prescription and meal dispensing, patient intake and visitor control and patient and family socializing. And of course, that was one of the really critical things that we've seen when you are enforcing strict quarantine and you're not allowing visitors. It's just such a different story if you're giving someone an iPad with the ability to, to video conference. And you might ask, well, why not just use iPads, not robots? And it turns out that an iPad really needs nursing staff there to control it. Whereas the robot that's doing telepresence can be controlled elsewhere. So the healthcare staff prefer to have a more intelligent form of an iPad for, the, for patients to communicate. And often we get a lot of, um, I suppose, uh, there is a lot of assumption that communicating via technology, particularly via robot, is somehow lesser than communicating direct person to person. But now we can see so many occasions when it's better than trying to do an in-person communication, which would cause so much risk or potential real harm to people. And we're finding that um, a lot of countries are now seriously reevaluating telepresence as part of a telehealth rollout. So we've had seven countries that were doing um, using robots for critical infrastructure, quality of life, work, employment work, and that's things like meal delivery or robots to socialize, tele telecommerce or e-commerce, robot assistance, and infrastructure protection. We definitely are seeing a huge demand for robots, as well as the robots doing some of the lab automation tasks, particularly handling infectious materials um, and manufacturing PPE and decontamination materials. And uh, we saw three countries in April using robots for non-hospital care, i.e. delivery to people who were in quarantine or enforced quarantine or nursing homes and nursing home socialization or off-site testing or testing in other locations. And now I'm going to leap forward. This was April 2020. And the next slide is one month later in May. Got it? Yes. Um, and Dr. Robin Murphy and her team are now tracking 73 countries using robots for public safety, public works, and public health, 37 countries using robots for clinical care, uh, including some new use cases there, for example, in inventory in clinical um, situations, 24 for the continuity of work and education, particularly around, say, sanitation of workplaces and school places, warehouse automation, construction, security, 19 countries reporting laboratory and supply chain automation, 14 countries reporting robots for quality of life, i.e. food delivery and other deliveries and facilitating socializing. And 12 countries were reporting robots being used for non-hospital care, uh, pretty much as we outlined before. And one of the statistics is by May, or by the end of May at any rate, 
there was a drop in the frequency of reported use cases. And this is at odds to the number of use cases. So it's really more reflecting on the fact that this is no longer fresh news, as it were. And so we're seeing a reduction in the amount that people are talking about where robots are being used and how robots are being used, but that's not reflected in how often robots are being utilized. And I speak to a lot of the robots com robotics companies and if they have a robot, a deployable robot that is applicable to some of these use cases, then they have been fielding non-stop inquiries. Can you make your robot do this and how can we get this set up? Now, I just see there's a question um, from Bet Lebrecht on, could I expand on how robots can help with enforcing quarantine? Well, some of the use cases that I have seen have included drones, for example, flying above people to say monitor congestion and to tell people to move apart. And I've heard it being proposed in ground robots as well to both monitor traffic flow and congestion in spaces and to inform people that they are too close or potentially in a quarantine situation it could be to do surveillance on the buildings and on the areas around the buildings. I can't think of the specific example that this would be a, a use case in. And I'll point out again that this is a study of both ground robots and aerial robot use cases. So moving to the next slide. One of the things that comes out very clearly from Robin Murphy's work is also the nature of the deployments of robots. And she says really there's three lessons to be learned from disaster robotics. And she's written a book about it, which I think I've got a slide of. I totally recommend that. But it's clear that the best robots to be deployed in a public health emergency or a disaster of any scenario are robots that are already in use. And there are several reasons for that. One is that it is simply just too much to expect people to tackle training on new robots. One is that robots that are in use are just going to be available more rapidly. And often the robots in use can be repurposed for a custom job or um, so. A mobile robot, for example, can be probably repurposed to do many things. And something bearing on um, this is one of the companies in Silicon Valley Robotics, Fetch Robotics, for example, does warehouse logistics automation. And they made a decision just a couple of years ago to focus on doing cloud control of their robots. And that means that they can repurpose robot operations without sending a team into the work site. And that was essential in repurposing um, workflows in any workplace to respond to pandemic um, safety, public safety and hygiene. When you bring your workforce back, how do you make sure that they stay six feet away from people? How do you make sure that they don't have to do tasks that involve them handing materials from one person to another? So what we saw is that particularly in cloud enabled robot platforms, but a robot platform that could be repurposed without sending people into a, a workspace and had traditionally been doing longer distance transportation jobs because that was the most useful application area for them were being repurposed and doing small transfer jobs in between people working rather than say work taking work from one side of a factory or warehouse to the other side of the warehouse it was more important to take work from one person to the next person so we've seen a huge rollout there and the other worry and i know piero referred to this is that our robots taking work away from people and in every instance in disaster response, they are tackling tasks that free up 
the responders, the frontline workers, to handle the increased workload that is coming with the territory. So those are really the lessons to be learned from the COVID deployments. Now, something that I have seen is there were five companies doing disinfecting robots before February. There are now 35, if not more, that have been identified. And Robin confirmed this. But most of those companies are not deploying yet. So they really haven't been useful in actually responding to the current situation. There are many, many people who've seen this as a potential business opportunity moving forward. And that is rather interesting. I mean, every person who, who's working in developing a new robotics company has had to ask and answer the question, is this a viable ongoing business? And uh, I'm seeing a lot of people moving in different directions on that. I think that's really an individual decision. Ah, yes, and here's the book from uh, Robin Murphy, Disaster Robotics. It, she really is the world's expert in this subject and uh, has fielded robots at all sorts of disasters. And we know, um, for example, the mining disaster in New Zealand, everybody wanted to deploy the robots and it was perhaps one of the worst possible scenarios. In general, a disaster scenario is the worst possible scenario to send in robots because it's a highly changing environment with many, many risks. And, you know, frankly, we need robots that are better tested in all of these scenarios and situations. So one of the things that I am really proud of is the way roboticists came together and worked in as a response to the pandemic. Now, interestingly enough, uh, these two groups, one was started by a group of roboticists directly, and the other ones involved a lot of roboticists. I know people, many people in both of these networks, and it's, to me, it's an incredibly empowering result because people didn't wait around for the problems that we could see coming. People started doing whatever they could to, to solve problems. And as long as we have people like that, I'm much more optimistic, uh, particularly when you see the, the really shocking results in a good way that have come from these volunteer efforts. Uh, from the Open Source Medical Supplies Group, it went from a couple of people and an idea in February, a Facebook group, and now the group is responsible for producing 12 and a half million pieces of PPE around the world. And a lot of that energy has gone into finding new ways of sourcing, building, and distributing pieces of protective equipment that haven't been mass produced or have been somewhat mass produced, but using available materials and using available labor. And that's a little bit of the motivation from the helpful engineering group as well. This is a group that formed, uh, you may have heard of the 3D printed ventilator parts in Italy. And this is now a worldwide open source community incubator and 40 plus projects, some of which, for example, the origami face shield, I've been part of a number of groups in the Bay Area where we have been using laser cutters to produce hundreds of these face shields. And hundreds are needed because your average health facility will use at least one face shield per person per day. So we, we need thousands to keep a hospital running. As a part of being part of these projects, I saw help lists coming out of hospitals in any channel. And it was staggering just how much equipment was needed and how rapidly the community ramped up to provide it. Now, these groups are both going through a bit of an interesting time right now, and it's been reflected in the figures in the last two weeks. The production of volunteer PPE is dropping because many commercial um, providers are starting to step up 
And this isn't necessarily a good thing because many of these commercial providers, there's a lot of scams. And there are a lot of people that are far overly optimistic about what they can provide and how rapidly, but it's turned into a business. And a lot of the people who've been voluntarily making PPE have gotten tired and have needed to back off and take a break. So the demands for PPE are dropping. People are now looking for commercial sources to satisfy the demands. But it was on the backs of the community that we actually met the supply demand challenges in the United States at the very least. Certainly in California, I've seen this and I've heard the reports from Boston and from New York. Um, but th these have been global initiatives. And I just want to show you by sharing the, um, this initiative started in March and in the whole of March, and obviously these tallies are, in yet, are, are going to be restricted to the information that they can collect. But the Open Source Medical Supplies Group produced as best as they could track almost 300,000 pieces of personal protective equipment across 21 countries in March. And this was constructing things like ventilator splitters, face shields, hand sanitizer pumps, face uh, visors for face shields, uh, rigid respirators, surgical level masks, cloth masks, N95 level masks and face shields. And I now know much more than I ever expected to know about the differentiation between various masks for the purposes of this. But that was March. By April, we're talking five and a half million. And we've seen um, an increase in community things like ear savers, for example, which if you wear a mask all day, having something to take the pressure off your ears is significant. And that's something where um, as part of the origami face shield project, I was involved in redesigning an ear saver. And these are all open source designs that can be accessed by anybody to be produced. We started around April, we started to see commercial donations moving a little bit into the space. And it was really by the end of April, we were collecting um, rolls of PET, clear plastic from Coca-Cola, for example, and distributing them to networks of people and companies with equipment that were willing to make PPE. And I'll just um, move one more month ahead into May, 6.87 million items produced over 30 countries. And it moved into some other things as well, like surgical gowns. And perhaps one of the big areas is, um, trying to find the, the word for it, but the, um, the full head rebreathers, really, um, pressurized PAPR, um, the hoods that can be worn if you can't uh, achieve adequate mask seal for health professionals. One of the things that I loved about being part of this process is that these groups innovated on how to do things amazingly. So for example, uh, ventilator splitters, it turns out to be pretty much like the sort of thing you can go into any Home Depot or hardware shop and get like a Y valve connect, but it was designed specifically to fit onto ventilators safely. And it, um, these splitters from one company got FDA approval very rapidly. So the FDA was trying to get involved in providing rapid approval for items that met certain needs. One of the groups that was involved here was a NASA group that redesigned the ventilator. Uh, there was a lot of really good work done on redesigning much more affordable ventilators. And we saw that all the way down to designing better face shields, ear savers, surgical gowns, and PAPR masks. So, um, oh, and nasopharyngeal swabs, for example. At the moment, COVID testing requires a stick being inserted in the nostril for tests. Well, it turns out these had traditionally been done where you kind of take a stick and then you glue cotton swabbing to the end of it. But you can 3D print something that is actually better 
softer, easier to deploy inside a nostril and collect samples. So this is the innovative design that has happened as a result of this. And I'm looking forward to seeing what, what is going to be commercialized from this point onwards, because you know, imagine what you can do when you have a community of engineers mobilized like this, wanting to build better any things. It was really fascinating. Oh yes, and this is just the whole period from March to June, 13 million pieces of PPE across 54 countries. And these groups are directly involved with um, facilitating local groups, building and making COVID response supplies in everywhere from Africa to Australia. And from the looks of things, Alaska or the Arctic Circle. Here are my details if you need to contact me. Uh, very good. Thank you, Andra. Now, uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, I mean, the, the urgent problem we have now, of course, is this pandemic. Now, if you, if we go back to the early slides, <clears throat> you were talking about ways that uh, robots have been uh, employed, but uh, I mean, I haven't seen any uh, in the in the hospital I visited, I, I was tested for COVID and then I had to see, oh, yeah. I had to get another vaccination unrelated. And uh, <clears throat> so the question is, what does it take to have a really a massive deployment of robots that disinfect areas? Uh, I don't know, robots that test people's temperatures, uh, students going to a classroom. Uh, is it a matter of cost? Uh, is it a matter of technology that doesn't work too well? So actually it's not being used because it doesn't work too well? Or is it a matter of, I don't know, you, you tell me. Why, why we don't see thousands and thousands of robots? Right now, Beijing is, is being, uh, parts of Beijing is being locked down again. But when, when I was watching the videos, it was all human beings uh, running the show. The reality is that robotics is still a small industry. There are almost 2 million industrial robots in the world. That's not really a lot. There are almost 20 million Roombas in the world, and that might be one of the most widely distributed robots everywhere. So even when we're talking about Walmart planning a huge rollout of robots, we're still talking about hundreds to thousands. And that's a, a large company. That's not going to mean that we can um, have as many robots as we need yet by any means. But the fact that we're going to be rolling out more robots doing deliveries in hospital, doing telehealth in hospital, telepresence in the hospital, and potentially lab automation in hospital means the greater the chance that we have of repurposing those robots to deal with the unique situation that comes up. You this pandemic has caught us right on the cusp where we don't yet have significant rollouts of robots, really. And every place that's had robots has been using them immensely and is trying to get more. And uh, that is perhaps the challenge. It, the robotics companies that are in business at the moment still have to scale production up. And of course, our supply chain broke down. So you know, we can't suddenly create hundreds of thousands of new robots. We more or less have to have those robots already in the ecosystem. And they have to be doing tasks similar to the tasks that we would need to repurpose them for. And I see we've got a couple more questions here as well. Ah, from Univ, are there turnkey robots existent now that will automate dishwashing? Or would six or more figures be needed to be spent just to set up automation systems for processing dishes? Well, Dishcraft Robotics has a system and you can contract them to clean your dishes. Uh, depending on how far they've scaled, they might only be in the Bay Area at this point. So that speaks to Piero's point. You know, we can't free up every hospital cafeteria, for example, and in fact, I was talking to some robotics companies that do food vending machines, and the demand for those is huge. No personal interaction, um, safe, 
and sanitary ability to get food and particularly for healthcare workers that are working all hours of the day in shifts and no cafeteria in action, this would allow people to get healthy food. But again, a lot of those sort of vending robot solutions were only just starting to be deployed in one or two locations. And what area, another question, what areas countries do I see applying robotics for hospitals or businesses at a mass scale first? Well, this is where, you know, I'll reflect back this retail industry is deploying robots at scale at the moment and warehouse logistics. So we will have greater opportunity to perhaps repurpose some of those robots in the future. Hospitals have been an early adapter of robots. Most hospitals have three to five different companies providing robots within the hospital, but it's often been only a small deployment. So for example, Piero, when you were in getting tested, they might have had no robots involved in the diagnostics, but they might have had a pharmacy robot helping with the dispensing. They might have had um, a robot delivering meals, meal trays towards and or delivering laundry because those were two of the earliest jobs in which the what, what I would call stupid mobile robots as opposed to the new wave of smart mobile robots uh, were originally deployed in hospitals and those were two of the primary tasks was providing moving heavy things to and fro hospital wards. And yeah, the question was also about the countries, which, uh, mm -hmm. which, okay, you want to answer that? Because I also had the question at the very beginning when you had the, the number of countries that were early adopters of uh, robots for this pandemic, and then it exploded to 70 plus uh, countries. And I was curious, okay. I mean, are those, the, are those the usual suspects? I mean, Europe, US, uh, Japan, and China, or... Uh, or is it more widespread? Well, it certainly becomes widespread, but I think China, it was probably the first country to really showcase the deployment of robots in more than one kind of use case. We saw a lot of work that Cloud Minds was doing, for example, in Wuhan, and they were doing disinfecting robots. They were doing, I, I think, things like some meal delivery. Uh, they were working with their version of the pepper robot in a number of use cases. Um, yeah, I agree. And, and China is also doing a good job or demystifying the robots, making them look more friendly. I saw in the Zhejiang province, uh, uh, a school has a little robot dispensing soap for children, so children will wash their hands more often. And the robot is a, is a cartoon character, I don't remember which one. So that that helps uh, people trust uh, the, the machine better, and it also uh, it, it also increases good habits in uh, in people. Is there is there a country that actually has a, a national organic plan on uh, using developing using robots for pandemics? A number of countries are working on plans or have plans, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have deployments. So for example, Europe had an early lead in some disinfecting robots, but that is primarily because they happen to have a company that had acquired a disinfecting robot company. And, um, you know, at the same time, it, it really was a case of who had the right bets on the table at that time. Now, as said, we've gone from having five companies that make disinfecting robots to having 35, if not more by now. Whether those are all quality robotics businesses, that's the different problem that I think we face right now is the companies that were originally in this field, we were all able to know a lot more about them and about the quality of their products. Now, I question if a complete newcomer is able to deliver sufficient reliability you know do they have a track record in building and making robots so the robotics industry is still small and that is uh, a shortcoming
when we're trying to tackle things at pandemic and or global level. Yeah, so it's uh, <clears throat> it's uh, it's puzzling again that the no government came up with the idea. Uh, let's let's uh, let's have a national program uh, to develop the the robots we need uh, in the medical field. Uh, this pandemic should be the, the perfect opportunity uh, to develop, to fund and develop research in the robots that can walk around in the street and uh, and test uh, the temperature of people. Robots that can walk nonstop in buildings and disinfect. Uh, this will make a difference, in my opinion. Yes. Well, I think two things there. One, for example, is that the um, the U.S. way of going about it is to encourage entrepreneurial behavior and to you know allow to say if the market's ready then people will make those companies and indeed one of the disadvantages of having robotics um, response driven by a, um, a a national call is the length of time that that can take now i'm not as up to speed on the various national robotic uh, roadmaps that are out there, but there definitely are national robotics roadmaps calling for increased um, investment in automation, increased research and development in automation, and increased on entrepreneurial um, companies in these fields and offering some sort of support. But you can artificially limit what's happening so that for example, if country X has got a national plan saying we want these sorts of robots and we want them to be um, developed in, the, in our country, then you're turning away from the possibility of somebody else having a better product. I don't think that's entirely a bad thing because I do see a lot, particularly in the health sector, of robots that are being uh, developed that are, for example, exoskeletons. There is m almost a, a kind of a regional exoskeleton out there. There is, you know, one developed in New Zealand, there's one developed in Israel, there's one developed in Russia, there's one developed in France, there's several developed in the US. Um, I'm starting to think that simply to respond to the local uh, medical regulatory industry there needs to be a regional response for something like that. So perhaps the question is, where does it need to be done on a regional basis in terms of the regulatory structure? And where can general market competition kind of be sufficient? Okay. Okay, if there's no other question, we can leave it there. I think we had more than one hour. So time to go and eat something. Um, oh my goodness, yes. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. Uh, a reminder that this conversation will continue on June, 11, June 18 at 6 p.m. with a special guest live from China. Andra cannot pronounce his name. I can't. <laughs> Jukun Zheng? Uh, I, I was letting you uh, uh, get embarrassed with the Chinese. Uh, uh, anyway, well, you can I find... You can find a link to register for this conversation at lasertalks.com. Uh, thank you, everybody. And let's see the next one. Thank you, Andra, very much for your presentation. Oh, thank you very much, Piero. I'm looking forward to the next talk. Uh, see you on Thursday.